this morning was on what do we do to advance the leak manifesto and I'm assuming most people in this room from Canada are familiar with it. It's a vision that incorporates indigenous rights, equality for, for groups that are on the margins of our society, and um, overcoming the challenges of climate change. And, and all three dimensions are important. But there's a very good reason why the Leap Manifesto begins with indigenous rights. And that's because if we don't get that correct, if we don't overcome the burden of colonialism, we're not going to achieve the other goals. And central to that, precisely, is the struggle around free prior and informed consent that Roy raised. And this is going to be a long struggle. It's an ongoing one. It took about 20 years to get the principle of free prior and informed consent into the UN Declaration on the rights of indigenous people. And like the FAO, what you described, Roy, it's there on paper. And we were hopeful with the rhetoric of the, uh, the present Trudeau government that they were going to implement it. But then they said, well, you know, Romeo, Romeo Sagadish's private member's bill that simply said, write it into Canadian law. No, we're not going to do that. We want to do that in a Canadian way. And that set up a lot of, of red flags because they're, they're not willing to take the logic of that and simply say, yes, we are going to re respect free prior and informed consent for indigenous people. So where are we at? There's several tests that are going on right now. The Chicolton decision was certainly an important victory. But just two weeks ago, around the Site C Dam in British Columbia, when the federal government had the ability to listen to the Treaty 8 people who have gone to court and said, don't build the dam until we give our consent, went ahead and gave permits through the Department of Fisheries and Transportation for the Site C Dam. And I'm proud to say that Kairos has put out a very strong statement, you can find it on our website, protesting that decision. So that's a setback, but it's not the end of the story. Alma has been talking about the struggle in New Brunswick around the Energy East pipeline. Very similar there, where, the, where the, the peoples in New Brunswick are united, demanding to have their, their, their right to free prior and informed consent. So we're going to have to struggle in, in some ways um, through, through various uh, of, of these projects. There'll be setbacks and there'll be victories. And then finally, we will have to actually encode it in, in Canadian law. But we're not there yet. And we shouldn't be naive about the rhetoric of the present government. I heard a lot about that this morning, I'll tell you. Just to, to go on a little bit, going, going back to Ellie's question to, uh, to Gloria about, uh, about Buen Vivir and, and what it means. And, and as Gloria said, um, you know, it's not a simple formula that can be applied anywhere. However, there are principles that we can learn from the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And we've done some research on that in um, Kairos. We've done this study on indigenous wisdom living in harmony with Mother Earth. And the first chapters describe what is going on in, particularly in Bolivia and Ecuador. And then we take the principles and say, what might they mean in Canada? What do they mean for, for the, an economy over-dependent on extracting bitumen and exporting it? Well, we can learn lessons from, from, from the Americas, in, indigenous peoples, about how to resist that and what might be some of the alternatives. And here's where we get back to the jobs issue. Because as Gloria was again saying so eloquently, the alternatives are those that give life. And it's important that when we talk about just transition and this question of where are our children and our grandchildren going to find jobs, it's not just the renewable energy economy. We need that. We need people to build the solar panels and install the wind turbines, sure. But the other industries that give life in education, in the arts, in childcare, those programs we're still struggling for in Canada. They're also ways, not only just of creating employment, but of, of making a sustainable economy. And it means getting away from false indicators, like gross domestic product, or something that's destructive, 
accounts to increase the GDP to real ind indicators. And I'm really struck with the recent work from uh, our friend Jim Stanford. What we should be looking at is employment indicators as, as a real sign of, of what our, uh, our economy is, uh, is or is not producing life-giving um, results. And uh, this can be employment, as I say, not just in, uh, certainly not in extraction and not in just in renewable energy, but in, in other professions. So that's one way. And then Tara, in her question, was asking about, about consumerism. Because if there's a central message that comes from the study of, of the wisdom of indigenous peoples and when we veer, it's the one, again, that Gloria has, has reiterated of thinking about what do we really need? Do we need all those gadgets? Do we need all those consumer items? Can we not redistribute uh, wealth in such a way that we buy things that, that really sustain and give life and not the luxuries? Well, that's part of the vision. Stop. Great, thank you, John.